Our speaker today is Lauren Crawford, and he will talk about probabilistic gener generative frameworks for sampling 3D complex shapes and images. Take it away. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me. Um, so for those who don't know me, my name is Lauren Crawford. I'm a, a principal researcher at Microsoft Research New England and a, a professor in uh, the Department of Statistics uh, at, at Brown. Um, I would like to start some of these talks off uh, to these types of audiences that like kind of introducing myself. I, I self-identify as, as a statistician. Uh, if you look at my website, you might wonder uh, what it is that we actually focus on and do. Uh, we, we, my lab tends to span a, a bunch of different areas um, from areas in, in um, genetics and evolutionary biology to things in uh, public health, as well as recently uh, physics and even sociotechnical systems. Um, I like to say that I'm a, you know, I'm a statistician uh, that, that thinks about uh, you know, problems very deeply. And I don't like to build these really fancy hammers that can't look for nails. We actually care about specific problems in each of these, in each of these spaces. Um, and at the crux of, of my research program is this idea of dissecting phenotypic variation. And you get to give about a phenotype as anything, something as, um, as simple as, as height or body mass index for, for human beings or something as a little bit more complicated uh, uh, like T cell count in, in different mice. So here's a really cool plot from 131 different traits from a, a panel of mice. Um, and here, what you're seeing is us taking a variance component model and statistics and asking this question, you know, what type of effects are driving the variation that we're seeing across these different traits? And so at the top, you'll see additive effects, which is this idea of like gene A's effect plus gene B. Uh, the second order, you'll see pairwise, which is gene A's effect times gene B. Third order will be gene A's effect times gene B times gene C. And the last thing is asking, well, how did our genes interact with our environment? And what's really cool about this panel is you can see that there are uh, different um, uh, components that make up or drive the variation of these traits, depending on what category I'm looking at, right? And so we built that statistical model to kind of think about this question a lot from a, from a biological perspective. Now, today's talk, we're going to actually ask this question of uh, dissecting phenotypic variation, but now instead of asking this on a molecular scale, we're asking this across uh, collections or panels of shapes, right? And so you can think about a phenotype as also being uh, this collection of beaks from different um, finches on the left-hand side, or a collection of heel bones and understanding the morphological variation that might exist across these heel bones across different primates that you'll see on the right-hand side. And so we're going to build statistical models to ask questions that how we kind of dissect this, uh, this uh, phenotypic architecture. Um, in today's talk, we'll, we'll focus a lot on uh, this idea of shapes, and shapes in our case are going to be represented as meshes. So you're going to hear me say this a, a lot because we're going to use uh, things like the oily characteristic a lot in this talk. Uh, this idea of um, meshes being collections of vertices, edges, and faces. Um, here at the bottom, you'll see a, uh, this is a collection, this is a brain tumor, effectively. So you'll see this idea of this, um, this like triangulization kind of grain, this mesh, and we'll, we'll use this representation a lot when I'm talking about data. Um, and so, you know, in our stat models that we end up doing, a lot of this stuff is going to be from this notion of uh, effectively supervised learning. You know, we'll have this idea where we have a phenotype of interest. Uh, again, that could be anything, some, some measurement that we have for all observations in our data set. Uh, I might know that these individuals or these um, uh, shapes come from individuals who are, are sick versus healthy. Uh, I might have an idea of this being a, someone that has a mutation versus not. Um, so we'll have some like phenotypic uh, label for all of our, our, our samples. And then we'll have some like genotypic proxy. Okay, so we won't have access maybe to gene expression data, but we'll have some, have some access to their shapes. And what we're gonna do a lot in this part of this talk is turn these shapes into some representation that I can use to throw into any kind of statistical or machine learning type model, right? Um, and so here, uh, a lot of times, we're gonna use this idea of like the early characters to transform, uh, do this where uh, each individual point here will be some early characteristic uh, over some sweep. Um, so we'll have this large matrix where uh, the rows will represent our different samples. And each feature will be like some oil characteristics, summary statistic for a given shape. Okay. Now, I'm going to talk about this journey that I've kind of been on, talking, uh, trying to get to this notion of uh, modeling and, and um, creating methods that are able to generate 3D shapes from uh, from different distributions. Um, but I'll kind of talk about my my journey into getting this and how I'm actually motivated this from an application standpoint. So, you know, my journey in, into this area of of, of of TDA really started from this uh, project where. Um, we, we asked this question of if we could use topological data analysis to predict different uh, um, uh, clinical correlates in, in uh, patients with, with uh, brain cancer. Uh, and this is a collaboration with people uh, with Anthea Minod, uh, Cheyenne, and, and, and Raul, a picture there at the bottom. Um, and so in this particular project, um, you know, we had MRI scans from people with glioblastoma uh, collected from about like 40 different patients. 
Uh, this data is actually publicly available for those who are interested. Um, it's data that's been archived, all the images have been archived in the TCIA. Um, and each patient in this data set actually has matched genomic and clinical information that's also um, collected by the TCGA. So the really cool resource, because a lot of times you have disparate information that's kind of uh, passed around from, from different individuals. Here you actually have matched information for all these uh, patients, which is really nice. Um, so here's an example of what the kind of data looks like. Um, in this particular study on the, on the bottom, what we do is we take um, each MRI scan, we segment out the tumors. Uh, so you're kind of left with these, uh, with, this, with the images that you see on the, on the right-hand side. Um, in this particular uh, uh, application, what we did is we, we didn't take each uh, individual tumor and we, and we derived um, all the characteristic summary stats for them. So effectively, you take each tumor, you basically do these sweeps where you count vertices that in the faces along these sweeps. Uh, what you'll do is you'll get these like nice little curves. Um, to get the, an idea of the entire variation along the shape, what you'll do is you'll do a sweep, you'll rotate that image and do another sweep, and so you'll get curves over many different directions. And again, to create that like large high dimensional X matrix, what you'll do is you'll take all, each of these curves, take them across all these different directions, and you'll concatenate them, right? And so you'll have this like really nice curve, and this will be like your uh, uh, feature vector for this particular individual's uh, uh, MRI. Um, and this, in this model, what we did in the study, what we did is we uh, basically took all these uh, all the characteristics and we threw them into a, a nonlinear regression model. And so you, you can think about nonlinear regression model as, as, as very simply um, a kind of like a relaxed version of linear regression, where instead of assuming that I have a linear relationship between each of my features and some like coefficients, now I kind of relax that and said the relationship between my data and my, my, um, my phenotype of interest could be of any kind of form. Uh, here we'll take a very relaxed form and imagine that um, each of these oil characteristics are derived from some function space. So we'll put a prior over that function space uh, via GP, uh, where that GP is very much defined by um, this kernel or covariance function uh, at the bottom K, where you can think about this K kind of measuring the similarity between the oil characteristics between uh, each patient in my data, right? So K1, K, K X1, X2 is, is basically measuring the similarity between uh, the oil characteristics from, my, from one patient uh, one versus patient two. Um, and then in the, the, the secret sauce here is that we're going to do this in a nonlinear way. So that, that covariance matrix will, will encode that similarity via a nonlinear function. Now, the main, the main crux of this, uh, this first study was this notion of, um, well, if, um, you know, how, how predictive is a topological summary of someone's images versus uh, key tumor characteristics that I take in, in all other areas of, of, of um, you know, uh, clinical and health-based studies. And so what we did is we compared these, these older characteristics as, as predictors uh, versus like gene expression, which people naturally collect, or, or other kind of shape metrics like tumor morphometry and, and tumor volume gene metrics, right? And what we did is we asked, okay, so out of all of these different characteristics um, and these different predictors, um, how predictive are these of things like disease-free survival and overall survival um, when it comes to predicting um, these different clinical outcomes for these different patients? Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take each uh, predictor in isolation, throw them into a, that GP model I just showed, and then ask how predictive these are, these actual two outcomes, right? And we're gonna do this uh, where we take each of our data set and we're gonna split them into 80% uh, training and then 20% like tests, right? And then we'll do this a hundred different times and then we'll record the accuracy uh, based on root mean squared error, all right? So lower is gonna be better, all right? And I'm gonna explain what these two uh, phenotypes are on this, on this next slide, but here are the overall results. Um, and so just to orient you a little bit, each of the data types, so the predictors that we are going to um, uh, do our uh, predictions with are going to be labeled on, along uh, each of the rows. Uh, Disease-free survival is going to be in the blue. Overall survival is going to be on the right-hand side and the, right, the red. Uh, again, root mean squared error means lower is, is better. Uh, that predictive optimal means uh, the number of times out of the 100 different times we do this, that a given predictor was the best scoring, OK? Um, and, and so to get over to you a, a little bit more, you know, this overall survival is this time from when a patient was diagnosed to when that patient ends up uh, dying, right? And each, each, unfortunately, each individual in this uh, data set has a, had, a, had a death time. So uh, that's overall survival. Disease or survival is a little bit more uh, tailored uh, and a little bit more specific. It's the time that um, an individual was diagnosed to the time that when that cancer actually comes back. So when that, um, there's, a, there's a shorter period where a lot of times in the glioblastoma, an individual is diagnosed. Um, you know, they go under some kind of treatment, uh, that tumor looks like it goes away and then it comes back. And so that's what disease-free survival uh, is encoding. Um, and 
the as you can see across the different things, uh, each of these metrics or each of these predictors is is not as really there's no real separation between each of them for the overall survival case. And that's because that, that's such a long wide range. You know, an individual could be diagnosed with something and end up passing away from something else. Whereas these disease survival is much more tailored towards the actual disease, and so you can actually see a little bit more separation between the predictive accuracy for the oil characteristic uh, versus these other predictive types, right? This is a really cool example because it kind of started sparking this interest of, of what we could use these oily characteristics of tumor uh, um, uh, predictors for uh, and things past predictive based uh, analyses, right? And so they started getting this notion that if there could be a connection between um, shape and, and molecular based information, right? Like if, if something that's happening on molecular scale is actually manifesting itself via uh, a, a tumor topology and morphology. And so, um, you know, oncogene act activity and therapy resistance is actually a really big study in a lot of areas of, of molecular biology, um, where, you know, you know, just to take a step back into, uh, you know, molecular biology one-on-one, you know, we can think about the genes in our bodies or all of our bodies being like these kind of well-oiled machines, right? Where um, our, our machines, our, our, our cells uh, continuously regulate themselves. And so, you know, in a, in a pathway, effectively, the way that our genes talk to each other, you can think about this very simplistically as this kind of diagram on the left hand side, right? Um, in a regular, uh, in a regular healthy cell, what happens is growth signals in your body come in, and they tell your cells to basically talk to each other in what we call like a signaling cascade, right? So growth signals come in, uh, gene A talks to gene B, B talks to C, C talks to D, and D tells the cell it's okay to survive, proliferate, and grow, right? Um, and now when something gets uh, dysregulated, what ends up happening is the cell then tells itself, okay, something's out of whack here. Now we need to apoptose and, and die, right? So or otherwise kill yourself, right? Uh, what, what's uh, interesting is that in a cancerous setting, um, you'll have some mutation. So let's say this mutation happens on gene B. Um, regardless of whether or not growth signals are now coming in, what's happening is that B is always constitutively activated. Right, so B is always on. B is talking to C. C is talking to D, even when it's not supposed to. And D is telling the rest of the cell downstream to survive, proliferate, and grow, even though it's not supposed to. And they'll get this notion of, of uh, irregular growth, and that's how tumors uh, happen. Right. Now, in, in a lot of areas and a lot of different sub uh, cancer types, now we have these like really nice agents that can come in when I, if I know a mutation exists in a given individual, I can then I identify a drug agent that'll come in and block the activation of that given gene. Right. Uh, so I'll have a drug agent, the drug agent will tell B, now B is not shut off. Uh, C is now not talking to D, D is not talking to the rest of the cell. The cell now apoptosis and, and goes away. Um, and then it looks like that individual is healed. Um, now, but unfortunately, a lot of cases, and glioblastoma is actually one of these cases, um, where the patient looks like they're healed for, uh, you know, six to seven months. Um, and then what happens is uh, somehow out of downstream, something happens where the cell turns itself back on or figures out a way to escape the drug's uh, uh, potency. And the cell will then always be telling itself to turn uh, to survive, proliferate, and grow, even in the presence of drug. And then you'll have something where someone ends up relapsing. And that's this idea of therapeutic resistance, right? So what that past um, uh, study kind of suggested to me is that, you know, if we can predict that with, with uh, all the characteristics, it'd be really nice to kind of ask this question, you know, is there a connection between what's happening on a molecular scale and does that actually manifest itself uh, via shape? And so we've been, I've been on this kind of journey of trying to understand when shape variation can be used to explain biological phenomena, right? Um, and so that brought us to this notion of, well, let's try to build methods that don't just do this kind of predictive thing, but actually is able to almost do like variable selection on shapes, right? And that brought us to a, a couple of studies more recently um, where we've asked this question of, uh, building methods that, that can basically do this. Um, and so this is this is joint work by uh, uh, Bruce Wang, uh, uh, Tim, and, and, and Henry, they were pictured at the bottom, um, or we've been calling this a uh, sub-image analysis using topological summary statistics. The, the, we, we made this acronym work. The acronym uh, for short is, is Sinatra. Um, and Sinatra is, a, is basically a pipeline that allows us to think about how to do variable selection on 3D surfaces, right? Um, and so Sinatra is actually uh, really simple. It actually just takes a, a four basic steps. Um, so in the first step, what you do is you're going to give uh, um, uh, two separate meshes from two different groups. You're going to see me step away from uh, uh, tumors for a little bit because uh, cancer is hard. <laughs> so we'll stick to a little bit more easy shapes in this particular, these next couple examples. 
Um, so what Sinatra does, you give you give uh, you give it two different shades from two different classes. So let's say you have two different species in this particular case. Um, at the top, you'll have um, a tooth from a primate of of one species. At the bottom, you have a, another tooth from the, of another primate from the, from different species. Uh, uh, let's say that one's a herbivore and one's a carnivore. What you'll do is you'll um, you'll derive these topological summary statistics for them. So you'll take these meshes and you'll do these sweeps where um, I have a, in a given direction, I'll count the older characteristics over these sweeps and I'll do this over many different directions. So I'll have these like really nice curves again uh, for each uh, particular um, uh, tooth in my data set. What I'll then do is I'll, I'll take these older characteristics and I'll, and I'll do basically a, a classification problem on them. So I'll fit, a, uh, I'll fit a model that is able to do variable selection. And the key thing here is that I wanna identify pieces of these curves that best describe the variation between the two groups, right? Um, so at the bottom here, you'll see species one versus species two. And I want to identify the pieces of these older characteristics that best describe the differences between these two groups. Now, the key part about the older characteristic is that um, I can actually go from older characteristic back to shape when I have access to the original shape. And I'll touch on this a little bit uh, later. And so what you could do is you could take the, the significant pieces of the differences between these curves and then project them back onto the actual image. What that allows you to do is actually visualize on the 3D surface, the differences that describe the variation between the two groups. And so here, what you see on the right-hand side is it's highlighting the actual morphological features uh, uh, that actually differentiate between uh, species one and species two. Now, um, Sinatra is actually very simple. Again, they're just general steps. So what I like to say is I'm gonna describe this as a pipeline. If you don't like any steps of the pipeline that I've mentioned, um, they're very general. So you can remove what I do specifically and put your own favorite method in the course of this pipeline uh, because I know we're all methods developers, particularly on this call. Um, uh, so so Sinatra's first step is very simple. You just wanna basically be able to represent shapes via summary statistics, uh, via their, to, uh, you know, that represent their topology slash geometry. Uh, what you wanna do with the summary statistics is be able to spit them into a model that is able to classify the shapes based on the summary stats. Um, then you, what you want to be able to do is derive uh, an evidence of association. So, so you want to be able to say like, okay, I know that these older characteristics or these summary stats are more are, are significant in defining the variation between my two groups, right? Um, and then what you want to do is once you identify those important features, you want to be able then to map those back onto the actual shape. Um, so we're going to do the first step by just using the older characteristic to keep it very simple. Uh, in the second step, I'll just we'll just revisit and use the Gaussian process since I've already introduced my model. Let's also keep that very simple. Now, the deriving evidence of association metric, what we're going to do is we're going to derive what we call an effect size analog, right? And you can think about this as, as a very simple thing. You know, in linear models, the way that I, I derive an, an effect size is like at the, at the top here, I'll have a, a linear model where again, um, y is equal to uh, is equal to some linear relationship between all of my features x. Some effect, some coefficients for those uh, uh, variables, and then some some noise, right? And the way that I get an estimate of those effect sizes is I basically take um, my my phenotype and I project it onto the column space of my data, right? And if I use least squares, what ends up happening is I just have some like linear operator, right, um, via some like set of generalized inverses that allow me to estimate these kind of like beta hats, right? And with these beta hats, what I can do is I can derive standard errors, get p values, derive significance, and all these types of things, right? So these beta hats are going to be um, what I used to do like effectively my hypothesis testing with. Um, we could do the exact same thing in, in, um, in with nonlinear models uh, as a, with a little bit of a twist, right? So instead of this X beta relationship that you see on the left hand side, we're going to relax that and just have some nonlinear function F. To derive the effect size analog, what I can do now is instead of projecting Y onto the column space of my data, I can actually project F like a smooth nonlinear function onto the column space of my data. And to keep things very simple, we can use a very similar standard like linear projection operator to, to do this, right? And so in the Sinatra algorithm, what we use is these like these kind of effects like analog weights to help us determine significance of which uh, oil characteristic feature is more important than others. Okay. So that's going to be our our uh, our third panel, our, our third step. And the last thing we do is that once you understand these uh, uh these which features are most important, we then want to perform some projection back onto the original shapes. Um, and so this is what we use to do like some um, uh, reconstruction algorithm to do this, okay? Um, and so the goal here is to take our selected features, project those back onto our, our, our shape uh, of interest. What we're gonna do to leverage uh, our, or to, to ensure that we have a lot of information is we're gonna leverage this idea that like if I take sweeps 
in a given direction. So I have a, I have a cone here, or I have, a, I have a shape in this direction. I'm doing my older characteristics sweep. I'm going to get a curve. If I take that shape and rotate it just a little bit, and I do another um, fil filtration and I get another curve, chances are that, that this minor change in direction is going to actually leverage and give me kind of very similar information. So we're gonna, I'm going to leverage this idea that like direct uh, oil characteristics taken in various uh, directions very close and near to each other are going to share a lot of information in terms of importance about the variation between two shapes, right? So the reconstruction algorithm in Sinatra goes, uh, uses the following steps. Now, first I pick a set of cone, uh, set of directions with a given cone. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna find all the vertices of the, that uh, correspond to uh, topological features that are selected by my GP for each direction, right? Within that cone. And I'm gonna repeat this like for all cones. And I'm gonna take the union of all my mapped vertices and then reconstruct my shape with those as being the most important, okay? So physically how that looks is, is the following. I'm gonna take a, I have a shape of interest. I'm gonna find some like cone of directions. Um, I'm gonna identify uh, the features that are most important within that given cone, right? I'll select another cone, I'll do that same thing and I'll take the union of those and that's how you get that really nice uh, image that I showed you in that pipeline uh, schematic plot. And so that's, that's the Sinatra pipeline and 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 since uh running this we've actually um uh we did a little uh had a little apple branding i guess where we decided to also think about how this could be applied to other things and so that was to help us create sinatra pro sinatra pro is a very similar thing it's just used for proteins instead of uh, uh other shapes um where the the concept is very very similar now instead of um uh teeth from two different sets of primates or, or shapes from two different sets of classes. Now you have uh, protein structures, uh, one of, of two different uh, mutation types. Uh, so one, you'll have a, a wild type versus a mutant, for instance. Um, there's an additional step in the, in the protein structure problem where you need, to you need to construct a creative 3D mesh yourself because you're not actually given 3D meshes, you're given atomic positions. And so you need to figure out a way to connect those atomic positions to create that mesh. And so that's the additional step that Sinatra Pro has, the other one doesn't. Um, but the same thing, the rest of the pipeline holds, right? You'll do these filtrations, you'll correct these curves, um, and then you'll identify the piece of the curves that best describe mutant versus wild type, and you'll be able to identify actual physical residues that separate the difference between mutant versus wild types in terms of how uh, they they move over uh, uh, time. Uh, yeah, uh, Bastian, hey, how are you? Hey, <laughs> nice to see you. It's a great talk. Yeah. If uh, Just a quick question, because uh, yeah. maybe you're saying this in on the next slide or so. Hmm. Uh, how how do you get this uh, this mesh representation actually? So how does this how does this connectivity work? Is this an a via choice rips type of process, or are there some actual predefined nice thresholds where that, that you know? totally totally depends? You can do it either way. Mm -hmm. um, in this particular study, we uh, picked um, we use like physical understanding of how close certain atoms are in terms of angstroms and then allowed those distances to define whether or not we drew a, a connected line between them um, and mm -hmm. then create the rest of it and then fill in the mesh from there. We could also take a non-biased approach and do it a, a different way. Um, in this yeah. particular paper, in this paper, um, we explored different types of ways of doing this um, and showed that like we, uh, for some protein types, you'll it's, it's pretty robust. Uh, so Nacho is not perfect. And I'll talk about some of it. I could talk about some of its uh, uh, um, weaknesses uh, later in the talk, but, but one thing that's hard, uh, harder for Sinatra is, Sinatra is very good when there's uh, low interclass heterogeneity. Um, mm -hmm. And so within a given class, as long as you're constructing these meshes or uh, in a way where, um, uh, you know, as long as as long as there's a, not a lot of inherited uh, variation within a given group, it's able to define differences across groups. The reason why the tumors and even for some proteins, why it gets a lot more difficult is, you know, depending on how you create these meshes, you could have high her high variation between um, any given uh, structure in a given class. And what that does is it make, actually makes Sinatra's job a lot harder because it can't define the variation between it within a given group. So it's hard to identify variation across groups. And then it just kind of tells you, it kind of gives you noise effectively. Um, and so there's kind of this spectrum for which Sinatra is actually really useful. It's, it's, it's um, to me, there, there, in practice, we show this in the first paper, there are two null cases. The first case for Sinatra is not useful is um, the case where there's no, no differences between two groups, right? All shapes look the same. 
and that it's not going to identify anything. But the second case is where the shapes look completely different, like where I have two objects that are just um, I can identify by eye that these two things are different. Um, so not sure what not just going to tell you is like uh, if you if you're looking for a single feature that's different, it's not just going to say well everything's different, and it's not that's also not going to be helpful. So it's actually only interesting in cases that kind of fall in the middle, where there's there is uh, some similarities between the two groups, but then there are a few unique differences between them. Um, and, and, and the examples I'll show, these are kind of connected to like evolutionary processes. And so when we build these like meshes, we're kind of thinking about those, like try not to get ourselves into those two edge cases a lot of the times um, if we don't have access to the actual information. Yeah. Okay, no, thank, thank you. That, that, yeah. that, is, that, that was very comprehensive and, and very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so let me show a few examples of, of this, and I'm happy to talk more about the pros and cons of, of, this, of these approaches because um, we've, we've got a lot about these. Um, you know, in the in the, in the first uh, you know set of examples, um, and this is showing like an MD simulation for the Sinatra Pro example. Um, you know, so for Sinatra Pro uh, to extend on the first uh, uh, study, you know, it also takes in like uh, taking like dynamic information. So uh, let's say you have uh, these are these are MD simulations that's showing how proteins can form over time, over short time spans, um, and so wild types might move differently in their conformations versus uh, uh, mutants. And what's so not just going to be able to identify is the parts of the proteins that move differently for a wild type versus a, a, a mutant. Um, and this is actually work done uh, by, by Wei Xing, who's now uh, at the Flatiron Institute um, as, a, as a postdoctoral fellow. Um, and so let me kind of show how this works for, for a few things and, and we can go from there. So the, the, one, the one thing about this generative model stuff that, that I underappreciated when I first started this is how hard it's actually to do simulation. Um, so in statistics, I think we take this for granted all the time. You know, when I build a model and I want to identify whether or not it has power or not, I just do a, a bunch of simulations to understand the scenarios which I think is going to work well versus when it's not going to work well. This is a little bit harder for shapes because in our case, what we really want is we want a collection of shapes with like a phenotype that's like attached to that given shape, right? So I have a shape and I want that shape to have some label that like almost like a regenerative model process. That is a, that I can then say, um, you know, this shape is attached to this label, and if I change shape A in, in this way, that'll affect my understanding about my label or my phenotype in this way, right? Like there's almost like a parametric kind of relationship. It's hard to think about that a lot of times in shape. So, you know, we kind of piecewise ourselves to this, and this allows us to think about more generative type models in, in, this, in my last part of this talk. So, you know, to first uh, identify the different ways to, to analyze, not true. Um, we did a couple of proof of concept simulations. These are actually quite simple. So, you know, let's say I have two different spheres. What I can do with these spheres is I can I can um, create two classes by basically uh, uh, um, creating features that differentiate the shapes myself, right? So I have two spheres. What I'll do is I'll create a bunch of uh, shared regions. So I'll take both of my I'll, uh, I'll take a hundred spheres. For all hundred spheres, I'll create these cusps in the like in the same general location according to like a little bit of um, geographical or, or spherical noise. Um, and these cusps will be shared across all groups, right? Then what I'll do is I'll create causal regions that are class specific. So I'll take 50 of those spheres and I'll create these indentations in one region of these spheres for class A. And I'll do the same thing uh, in another set of regions uh, for class B. So the other 50 will get indentations in another geographical location on them. Uh, okay, And those will create my two classes. And my idea with Sinatra and testing is, is going to say, well, can a Sinatra identify the indentations um, before it identifies anything else as being the differential descriptors between these two groups? Um, and so here's the sensitivity uh, analysis. And what happens is uh, what we're doing is uh, we create a bunch of scenarios where I increase the number of both shared and indentation, uh, indentations that are happening um, along, this, along this spectrum. Right. And uh, I, I was just mentioning Sebastian, like these things get harder as I create more variation within a given group. Right. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot easier to think about um, uh, what's differentiating two groups for just uh, one indent. But if I create a bunch of them, then I have a lot more uh, noise that's happening. And so it's going to be a little bit harder for Sinatra as I move out to, see, to scenario three. This is very similar to what we think about in genetics a lot of times. So um, 
you know, genetics, I can think about signal as being um, more easily detectable when they're just when there are just a few features driving the variation for a trait, right? And the reason for that is like, let's say I have a, I have a pie here um, and I'm saying that the genetic in signal is the thing that I actually care about identifying. Well, there are only a few genes that drive the variation of a trait. Um, what happens is I just break up that genetic signal into let's say just six components. What that means is that each of these six components actually have a large effect size, right? Like the, each individual feature explains quite a bit of the variation amongst this, this pie. So my, my variable selection model should be able to identify the SNPs or the, the genetic features here a lot easier. Now, an apologetic architecture is a lot harder because what I do now is I say there are many features affecting the variation of that trait. And what you can see is that the effect sizes, right, the, the amount of variation that each feature now explains had gotten tinier and tinier. And so my ability to actually identify the variation between two groups has gotten a lot tougher, right? That's the exact same thing that you're seeing that's happening with the Sinatra idea, right? As I increase the number of causal features, the number of the, the amount of variation explained by any one of given those causal features gets a lot harder as I move from one to, to five, six, seven, or eight, right? And that's what you're actually going to see in terms of power. So uh, here you're looking at uh, uh, rock curves where I'm just asking the, the true positive rate versus the false positive rate. And you can see as I kind of move along the spectrum where I make this kind of harder, you can see the power of Sinatra kind of dip as this problem gets more gets much more tough, right? Um, so that goes right along with our idea of, of, of um, uh, what we would expect for this particular method. Um, the same thing so kind of holds. Yeah, yeah. I can interrupt. Uh, like in this this last slide, uh, what were the different uh, colors of curves? Oh yeah, so these are this, oh. is a this is sensitivity analysis. Yeah, so in this, um, and so has a few um, uh, free parameters. One of those parameters is how many directions that we take, and um, uh, there's been theory that says that if I take infinitely many directions, I'll be able to summarize all the variation of my shape sufficiently, right? Well, in, in practice, you're not gonna take infinitely many. So we show that like, if you take sufficiently enough, at some point you're gonna hit this kind of like, like asking, like the ceiling and how much power you can actually have. And so what you're seeing here is a sensitivity analysis for, for each of these things. We increase the number of directions that we take across the different cones. Um, and you can see at some point, I never wanna take one because one just gives me nothing. And as I increase to uh, uh, 50 and 80, I start to hit this, uh, the ceiling where I maximize out the power that, that's not your head. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, um, we compare these across different baselines. Um, and uh, here you can see uh, an example where uh, as the scenarios are, are quite easy, a lot of methods are actually able to identify just that one shape. Um, and then like move to more typical scenarios, uh, that power kind of uh, starts to wane for all, for all methods, right? Um, we also did a very cool simulation that you can think about doing also with, with teeth, uh, with make it more a little bit realistic than just having shapes. Uh, from spheres. So here we take an original shape. Uh, we we uh, do this kind of perturbation or characterization where I take landmarks on those teeth. So if I want to create class one versus class two, I'll identify um, three, uh, three sets of landmarks that are different between the two groups. And I'll do like a characterization where I'll blow out the features. Then you can see like, uh, um, I, 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 you know, I, I add some kind of signal and noise to them. Then I ask the Sinatra to identify the, the caricature features between the two groups, and you can see how well it does on the on the right hand side. Um, the same concept holds. If I if I do this with more landmarks, the power of Sinatra is going to go down, right? And so if I do this with three scenarios on the on the left hand side, you can see the power of Sinatra again. The if I increase the number of cones, the power of Sinatra goes up, right? Um, but if I do this, if I create five uh, landmarks and I do characterization, right? The interclass heterogeneity gets a lot tougher. So you'll see again that for now that power of Sinatra starts to wane. Um, uh, and again, this is just uh, comparing us to different methods where this hardest scenario gets a little bit. Sorry, there was another question uh, before yeah. uh, again about this scenario two and scenario three. Uh, David asks, can you tell the number of cones in scenario two and scenario three? I think it might be related to my question. Uh, yeah, so um, the number of cones. Uh, so, okay, so let me take a step back. So we don't, so the number of scenarios one and two are how many of these landmarks we do perturbations for. Um, so we perturb, uh, there again, there, there are 50 shapes in this data set, 50 for class one, 50 for class two. We do the, we do the characterization on just um, three 
of these lamp these red points uh, for scenario one, and then five for scenario two. Um, then what we do in the Sinatra algorithm is we take the order characteristics either over five cones, so five cones of directions, uh, 15, 25, and 35. The idea is that if I increase the number of cones and directions I consider, the more um, the more of the shape I'm analyzing and the more variance I'm explaining. And so I should see Sinatra's power go up as I increase the number of cones. And so all you're seeing here is um, the, the that power difference across cones. And when I do the easy scenario of just doing the characterization for three shit, three peaks versus if I do those for five. Hope that answers the question. Yeah, I think that should answer it. Thank you. Cool. Um, so the last part of this talk um, that I'll get through is, is this notion of, of um, probabilistic frameworks for sampling of uh, uh, shapes. And so uh, this is led by, by, by Emily uh, Juan Nunez and an um, a, a, a undergrad has been helping her out, uh, 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 Ryan, um, as, as part of this, this is relatively new work. This was something like we're really excited about. And so, you know, motivated by that last part of this uh, talk, you know, we're, we've really been asking ourselves, okay, how do we actually generate shapes from like that, from a, from a uh, principled way where I want to say, okay, I have a shape of interest. I want to generate um, a, a, a set of shapes from via simulations, but I want to be able to control maybe uh, like causal features within them. Uh, I want to be able to say if I if I tweak this feature of the shape that should that should then uh, create um, a, a difference in my y variable in this way, and and just kind of having a probabilistic framework to kind of do this, and what we kind of realize is that it, there you know there are not a lot of uh, of these kind of frameworks out there that exist, but but if we want to be able to principally uh, uh, assess and analyze our methods, you know these types of things are going to be uh, needed, and so. You know, we've really been working with um, ways to do this, and we've come up with this idea of like the shape stamp, shape the alpha shape sampler uh, as our first go go at this. And so the alpha shape sampler is actually quite um, uh, interesting. What we want to do is we want to create realistic shapes from uh, that are not necessarily from our data set, but are kind of simulated, but have very similar structures as what we might assume to be uh, uh, realistic. And so what the alpha shape sampler does is it takes in real shapes. So let's again let's stick with our teeth example. It'll take in like in different shapes of interest. What it does is it's going to um, try to understand and learn um, uh, like a point cloud boundary for which it can sample new points to create random generated shapes from, right? But we want to do this in a realistic way. So what we do is we take each of our shapes. So let's consider one, one shape here, K. What we'll do is we'll, we'll look at each point within this shape and we'll try to understand uh, the distance between any given point in our shape and its given neighbors, right? Um, we'll, we'll do this for all points in our data set and, and we'll identify both the neighboring points and uh, different uh, the distance between uh, different circumcenters. And then we'll identify, uh, we'll take the max distance between all these and we'll compute these as this uh, variable tau. This tau is gonna be like this conditioning boundary point that we're gonna consider. If we do this for all shapes in our data set, what we'll do is we'll generate um, like a joint point cloud effectively, where we'll take all the shapes, we'll project them onto the similar point cloud space and with this joint point cloud is how we're going to actually sample from to generate new shapes. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll take our shapes, we'll take this combined point cloud. I'll pick some P, some point in the context of this point cloud. Um, I'll define a radius around that point cloud. And I'll basically sample to say, uh, based on the rejection, uh, uh, accept rejection step, whether or not I want to keep this new point as a point that I want to generate for my new shape, or if I want to reject it and throw it out, right? And so it's almost like you could think about this like a yeah a, re a, a rejection sampler or like a metropolis hasting for for generating new shapes right um, and so on the right hand side what you'll see is that we'll do this for a bunch of different points um, in this joint point cloud and then that'll be able to help me then recreate this like this set of new shapes that from which I can then start to analyze new data with right or 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 assess my new methods with right uh, so this is the alpha shape sampler and it's actually again really simple uh, the alpha shape sampler also has uh, a couple of general steps. Uh, what you do is you input, input a, a set of triangular or, or tetrahedral meshes, right? A, a basically collection of vertices, edges, spaces, and maybe tetrahedra. Um, you want to estimate some tau bound for, uh, for each like sim, simplicial uh, uh, complex here, uh, i.e. like each data point. Uh, we want to generate a point cloud based on um, uh, all these inputs as well as these taus. And then I want to output new shapes uh, uh, from the sample out, uh, uh, point cloud connecting points according to some uh, alpha parameter, right? 
And so, uh, you know, let's let's stick in our, our original thing. You know, all of our data in this particular talk have had uh, been in like mesh form. So let's assume that we're still going to stick in this mesh form. Um, you know, the second part of this is 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 to estimate conditioning uh, this conditioning number tau. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to take each point in our right each vertex and our thing. We're going to learn the distance between uh, that point and all neighboring points. Um, and we're going to save the largest Euclidean distance between that point and all its neighboring points. We're going to do this for all points in our data set. Uh, we're also going to define uh, these different circumcenters uh, of all faces and tetrahedra, and we're going to save this next distance as well. And we're going to save the overall dis the overall largest distance between uh, steps one and two. Um, the second set of uh, steps here uh, is to consider uh, 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 all points uh, that are do not actually share an edge with our point of interest. Um, and are more than the distance that that max distance that we computed. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to set that that set uh, as v star, and then we're going to uh, try to define these tau. And these tau bounds are going to be given by effectively like this this minimum of all these tau that we compute. Once I have a tau for all of my shapes in my data set, what I really want to do is take uh, some summary statistic of all the tau that I collect over all of my shapes. Um, we we take the minimum um, because that allows us to actually uh, both work with uh, you know, from a, except rejection step, it allows us to not have to reject so many points, um, but it also allows us uh, uh, to then uh, um, work and consider different variations of collections of shapes when we do our sampling in our, from our joint uh, point cloud at the bottom. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to generate a point cloud based on um, all of this data and these, and these tabs. Um, I'm going to leave this here, but the the interesting point about this is that we want to reconstruct shapes that are that are as close as possible to some manifold, right? And this alpha parameter is actually uh, uh, quite interesting because if we choose alpha to be too small, we'll have too many points, and we'll have a difficulty in in actually connecting them in our very last step when we generate new shapes in our point cloud. Um, and so the ideal value of, of alpha actually respects this tau bound um, and also preserves the homology of the of the manifold. There's some I irony here where um, you actually, uh, so, so doing this with too many shapes, um, if I do this with a shape that's a true outlier, um, this, a lot of our boundary is going to be actually really dominant by the outlier shape. And so, so there's a, there's an interesting uh, counterintuitive thing here where doing this, uh, kind of sampling with fewer shapes allows you to have more variation. So, uh, uh in your shapes that you actually sample from, and I can talk about this a little bit where, um, you know, if I have one shape that dominates uh, the this like boundary point, uh, it doesn't matter how many shapes I have that are variable within it. That boundary point is going to dominate. So I'm going to if I sample new shapes, they're all going to look like that random outlier shape. Uh, and so doing this with fewer points allows you to kind of change that boundary, and it gives you more variation when you look at new shapes at the end of your data set. Um, and I'll, I'll show this empirically in a little bit. Um, but effectively, we do like this rejection sampling shape scheme to generate new points. So um, you know, we'll calculate some number of, of points uh, uh, via uh, some some ball radius after I choose my thing. The, the idea is that we want to allow us, uh, this allows us to preserve local homology while keeping this boundary point along our point cloud. Um, so we'll choose some, some, uh, some value rho, which effectively means out of my combined point cloud, how do I, uh, I want to basically identify some sub point cloud of this thing. So I'll have a total point cloud joint between all my shapes. I'll take a subset of these points to be the shape, the points from which I'm going to do my sampling from. That's going to be my sub, uh, my sub point cloud. And then my sub point cloud, what I'll do is I'll take a, I'll pick different points. I'll define a ball of radius around those points. I will, uh, uh, that ball of radius is going to be centered around some, uh, some, uh, given radius and we'll, we'll choose that thing to be tau, tau over eight. Um, within that ball, I'll collect all those points. And I'll do a rejection sampling step. I'll say that if if the point that I sampled from is around a lot of points that um, have also been realized in my data set. So uh, I have a point that I ran and sampled. If the ball around it collects and captures a bunch of points from uh, that uh, that are actually in the data set that I'm sampling from, I'll treat that random point as being realistic, right? Because it's something that that is kind of in the middle of actually realized points. So I'll keep that point with high probability. If I sample a shape, or if I sample a point that's kind of on the boundary and it's it's not and, and in its radius, there are almost like no realized points. I'll I'll look at that point as being un, unrealistic or less realistic than something that's actually surrounded by real true data, right? 
And so that probability is going to go down with the with the fewer points that I actually have in this boundary, right? Um, so I either reset, reset, accept a new point or reject it with some probability. And I'll repeat this for all these points in my given, um, the, the number of points I'm going to sample in my sub point cloud. And then I'll regenerate my shapes with the ones that I just accepted, okay? Um, and so you'll get something that looks like this. So uh, uh, on the on the left hand side here, you'll have uh, this is an annulus that is that is a, a real annulus that we that we uh, physically made, and then one that we generated from a, a sampler. Right. This is a very easy example, but I'll show you what to keep in exact in a, in, a, in a second. And so with the, the idea of the alpha shape sampler is going to output output new shapes uh, with this like sample point cloud uh, connecting points according to this alpha parameter. Um, so here, just for the sake of time, uh, let me just show like a randomly generated teeth from some primates. So this is data. This is a data set that has CT scans of, of 59 uh, molars from different genre of primates. Um, they, they, they've broken down the, their phylogenetic relationships here. So you can see how different they, they kind of uh, break off according to this tree as evolution takes place, right? Um, we're going to generate two sets of uh, randomly generated data sets uh, using data with the uh, microsebus at the top and the tarsius at the bottom. Um, and so um, here's some real examples of this. Um, at the top, you'll have like actual real uh, the microsebus teeth. At the bottom, you'll have the generated ones. You actually see how nicely it actually captures a lot of like the different structure across these different teeth. Um, we can also do this for the tarsius as well. The tarsius is actually really interesting because the tarsius teeth, uh, according to evolution, uh, they preserve this kind of like lower cusp. And so if you look at these teeth at the lower bottom, you'll, you'll see these like this like interesting protruding cusp that allows them to digest and eat their food differently than the rest of the monkeys in this data set. Um, and so in our generated samples, you can actually see the same thing that like we actually preserve that, that structure. As a quick analysis, um, you know, what you can do, for instance, is I could take the real tarsius teeth, the generated tarsius teeth, the real microsebus teeth, and the, and the generated microsebus teeth, and I can say, okay, how realistic are these in terms of um, actually preserving different structures and being realistic? So what we do is we run like this landmark analysis where we um, we basically identify landmarks uh, on the real tarsius, on the real teeth and the generated teeth. I did, I, we compute progressive distances on these different sets of teeth. And then we project them down using like a UMAP to see like if we're actually getting proper mixing, because you can imagine that the teeth are realistic, they should mix together quite well, but also preserve the differences between the two groups. Um, and that's kind of what you see here. Um, so this is the UMAP from our randomly generated teeth. Uh, the microsebus and uh, generated in uh, real are in the corner there. And you can see this has really nice mixing between uh, both real and fake generated teeth, as well as at the bottom for the tarsius, the same kind of thing kind of holds. Um, so this is ongoing work. This is stuff that we've been doing. Um, I'll wrap up by saying that, um, you know, I moved away from the, the tumors a little bit because again, the tumor situation is a little, it's, it's hard. I'm happy to talk about the, the, the complexity there. But the idea hopefully is for us to actually move back. And so we really want to think about doing a lot of these kind of analyses, both with Sinatra as well as the alpha shape sampler uh, within the context of thinking about questions um, um, uh, in cancer biology. You can imagine that identifying individuals with glioblastoma from different rare cancer types is quite hard. So you can imagine the alpha shape sampler being a really cool tool to use where you can augment data with realistic data types um, and realistic structures for, for tumor shapes that you maybe haven't seen, right? To test your uh, uh, sensitivity to data um, um, uh, for your methods, for again, when data is hard to, to collect. Um, the second thing that we've been doing is trying to extend these methods past just um, uh, 3D objects and thinking about more imaging based uh, things. So you can think about 3D microscopy, uh, PET scans, things where like shape may not be readily available, right? Um, and so we have a few uh, ongoing experiments where we kind of show that this alpha shape sample is actually able to generate um, uh, cool images from uh, cellular biology, uh, like my different like microscopy type scans. Um, uh, as, a, as, a, as another application for, for shape generation um, and that, that don't just have to do with like 3D objects. So that's actually pretty cool. And also we want to continue to extend Sinatra in these kind of domains as well. So thinking about these more 3D related um, or, or, or uh, 3D imaging related examples. Um, with that, there's a ton of people to thank. Um, uh, there's acknowledgements from people across different uh, universities and, and um, 
uh, and institutions, uh, people have been nice enough to give us money. I really appreciate the organizers for, for inviting me to do this. This is always super fun. Uh, I love this community and I love chatting with people about this kind of stuff. Um, if anybody ever was interested in working together or collaborating, please feel free to reach out. We, we would love to uh, brainstorm and, and think about new projects moving forward. Uh, with that, here's some relevant resources and references. And uh, yeah, happy, happy to take questions if there are any more. Thank you very much. So let's please all unmute ourselves so that we can clap together to thank our speaker. Thank you. Are there any questions? I maybe have one to start with before the questions come flowing in. Um, for the alpha shape sampler, you need that the shapes are all um, oriented in the same way, like, right? Because um, I was a bit confused when you showed the torus example. Um, was it just the same torus from two different perspectives so that we can see? Yeah, 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 okay. yeah, 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 yeah. It was it was the same torus from two different examples. Yeah. So you're right. So you have to. So there's this is a key thing. So Sinatra can take unaligned shapes. What's what's cool about the Euler characteristic is when I when I throw in shapes that are unaligned, I can take the Euler characteristics that that come from those unaligned shapes. And if you align all the characteristics, you can actually, that actually implicitly aligns the 3D meshes themselves. And so there's a really cool, there we, we showed this in the paper, you could do this from like a, a, um, uh, a from a non chorus or un, with no correspondences type of perspective with Sinatra. The alpha shape sample is different uh, because if you have disoriented shapes that are not aligned, when you throw them, when you do this like joint point cloud sampling, you're going to be jointly sampling things from like an unaligned space. So you can get shapes that look quite different <laughs> from each other. And we had a few examples of this where uh, even with the teeth, if they were not actually aligned uh, beforehand, you can get this, uh, ex you can get these data sets where you get like complete uh, uh, disformed type uh, meshes only because the teeth that you're sampling your from are, are is highly dependent on the teeth that you're sampling from. Um, so that's, that's a huge uh, uh, um, like prerequisite before running. The alpha shape sampler. We, I, I don't know if it was on the call, but Emily and I have been thinking about ways to maybe get around this. I don't know if we've come up with a really fine and elegant solution for that yet, but that's that is a that is a caveat. Great, thank you. Okay, anyone who raises their hand or so? I don't see anyone. Ah, um, there is a question in the chat, namely, um, David is asking. I'm curious about what homology tells you about your shape sampling. Can you elaborate on that? Well, homology tells about our shape sampling. Yeah. Um, so, so we don't. So we don't use any homology. I think the idea in in this is we want to we want to preserve as much of it as as possible. Um, effectively, all we want to do so. Right, so there's a there's an interesting balance here between um, uh, theoretical persuasion and then also like empirically trying to make this work in, in scale. So um, what we would ideally like to do is have something, I have a shape sampler where we generate synthetic shapes that preserve the homology and the uh, 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 like these manifold differences between, preserve the manifold for, between, for shapes and between shapes, right? Um, we try to do that with this this tau bound. We try to have this notion of um, we want to preserve as much of this as possible. Um, a lot of this is probabilistic, right? Um, right. This is, there's this inherent notion of like re uh, accepting and rejecting. Also, there are a lot of um, heuristics that we choose. Where you know, um, for instance, um, uh, let's see, this tau that we end up selecting, uh, this tau over eight in this rejection sampling step is you know these are things that we ourselves uh decided to choose because of like stabilization across the algorithm right in rejection sampling schemes you don't want uh you don't want to have too high of a rejection probability and so we are too high of a rejection rate and so choosing sets of tau allows us to, to think about this so there's a balancing act here between um uh trying to preserve that as well as like trying to have the algorithm scale and work and allow us to have good uh, acceptance rates um so yeah that's that's all we i meant by by we're trying to do our best to reserve that so we'll choose like minimum we'll choose a small towel in order to think about these questions but but there's no 
formal checking of whether or not we're actually doing any of these perturbations along the way. Um, yeah, but happy to happy to take suggestions if people have thoughts there. Thank you. That makes sense. More questions. Hand hand. Pablo. Ah, yeah. Pablo. Oh, I think you're muted. So we, somehow you're not muted by Zoom, but maybe for your hardware oh. or so. And you. Yeah, maybe while you try to make your hardware um, work, I can ask a very short question in between. Um, yeah. Very in the beginning, you asked, you um, wrote at some point, you always wrote ECT for Euler characteristic transform, but at some point you wrote SECT, and I was wondering, is this mm. some kind of special? Yeah, so, so in, in the, in the uh, first paper that we ever did this with, um, so there are a few improvements that we made to the paper, um, uh, to this paper actually uh, here. Um, so in this, in this first version of the paper, what we did is, uh, we did a, a smooth order characteristic. So we had these like order characteristics, uh, you know, like the, actually just counting the verses and faces for things. And then what we end up doing is, is subtracting off means and, and, and making these like uh, smoother functions for which we could think then about the, the GP. Um, so the SCDT is just like a smooth order characteristic version of, of the order characteristic. It's just a smooth version of that. And that's effectively what this JASA paper at the bottom is doing. Um, the second thing that we did in this paper that we don't do now in other papers is, um, again, we were in our infancy here, uh, at least I was in my understanding a lot of how to, how to think about these things. But each mesh is treated as um, effectively independent in the way that we did our sweeps in this first paper. So we take, we have a bunch of MRI scans and what we'll do is we'll, um, we took these order characteristics over each scan and then to get an idea over um, uh, of like, like 3D information, we didn't integrate over each of the slices. So we'll have, we'll have a bunch of curves for each slice and then we integrate over each of these slices to then get like one final smooth curve to get an idea of like, if we looked at, looked at the shape as a whole. I mean, since then we've gotten a little bit more sophisticated where now we work with like actual images like this where, um, uh, we'll actually work with the mesh themselves. So uh, now what we do, now we have methods that are able to take uh, individual slices. What we know about each slice is we know the thickness of the slice and the distance taken between slices. So you can throw these into like a, a convolutional neural net or something and kind of reconstruct a mesh that looks like if I had um, taken each slice and kind of created the tumor itself by like filling in the gaps and the holes. And now if we were to do this again, we would work with like all the characteristics over like this representation of the data versus like the individual segments of things that we saw before. Yeah, so those are those are two main points I think about um, that are different between this paper and like the rest of the stuff that we've done. Uh, yeah, thank you. Can you hear me now? Is that all? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Great, thanks, yeah. Apple products seem to be just taking over on the round, so. <laughs> Anyway, thank you very much. Yeah, it's great. And it's nice that you had that last uh, video up. Which is, my question was kind of about oh, that. Um, yeah. So I know that in, in um, dermatological studies of uh, tumor growth on skin cells, there's mm -hmm. uh, an important factor of how a, uh, a growth stops being circular and how that um, like curvature develops around the edges. So my first question was about maybe just the biology of these tumor growths and whether the um, mean curvature of the surface that you're looking at has some sort of effect and importance in like the understanding of how the tumor is becoming like worse over time. Yeah, that, first of all, that's a great question. I so I'm gonna I'm gonna be honest here. I think that there are better there might be better sub cancer subtypes to start in doing this analysis for. So I think the issue with okay. The reason why we're so good in, I think, the other methods is because, or the other application areas, is because there's like this evolutionary pattern that happens, right? Like I showed the phylogenetic tree relationship, where um, if my teeth are of a certain morphology, I can't chew and break down food, right? It's just, I, it's hard. So I, there's a phylogenetic, evolution has decided what my interclass heterogeneity looks like. Um, I think the issue with the tumor growth in brains is there is no like evolutionary relationship where there, that might be more preserved, I think, in other things like, like say, the dermatologic setting where uh, melanomas, for instance, may have to grow in a certain way um, uh, and they just happen to, to do that versus like, I think what happens with uh, glioblastomas 
is that they grow in any kind of way that they can because their main hallmark is to proliferate and then, and then later like metastasize. And so I think what happens is the preservation of that curvature may not be as well controlled in the glioblastoma setting as maybe some of the other ones. And so, you know, part of this might be that we're just not focusing in the right cancer subtype to answer some of these questions uh, to begin with. Um, and I haven't done enough digging within the melanoma setting um, to know whether or not that's a better setting for us or, or not, but that, I, that easily could be. Um, that some of these properties are more, more, more well preserved than, than this. What we've seen in our cases, um, you know, if I were to do like a like a dimensionality clustering type plot of the structures and the curvature of uh, tumors um, of mutation uh, class A and class B for glioblastomas, you get a wide mismatch. Like it, it, it's it's highly heterogeneous. Um, you know, so I think that's also the other issue for us is that we just don't know. Yeah, great. Yeah. No, that's, that's very interesting. And um, the other kind of question, um, maybe a, pro probably a suggestion. Um, I know mm -hmm. that in, you know, C convolutional neural networks, CNNs are really um, kind of dependent on these alignments of things, unless you mm -hmm. systematize them some of, to, to accept symmetries in some other yeah. ways. Um, so kind of trying to get around this um, setting in a fixed axis, which is, I guess, something that has to be imposed uh, in a workflow like this, have you considered doing maybe um, spherical coordinates whereby you get like a center of mass of your tumor and then you get spheres that grow out? And then what you do is you, I mean, you can do the same workflow except that then you're taking the slices along those spheres and looking mm. at whatever particular characteristic of those traces and, and you know, there look like instead of on the planes that go slicing in the XYZ direction. Because yeah, that that's way, a really good idea. That way you'll just like get rid of this, like setting the axes. And then there's some sort of like choice to be made there all the time. That I think yeah, that's a, that's a great, that's a great idea. We haven't tried that, but I'm gonna, yeah, that's a great cool. idea. I'll, oh, I'm well, gonna write that down and think about it. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, maybe we can catch up offline about something like that. Um, like that. That'd be awesome, yeah. All right, thanks. Thanks again and thanks everyone. No, thank for you. Great. Then let's maybe end the public questions here and uh, stop the recording. But first, really, again, thank you for a very interesting talk. Thanks again for having me. This is great.